the evidence is that we as individuals, as human beings, are all creative. Uh, this comes from the world of linguistics. Uh, so in linguistics, every human being will create new sentences, new and unique sentences. So that's an example of creativity. So we're all creative to start off with. Two, concept that people have of creativity. So if you think of crea creativity means you're creating new art or products, a lot of people think creativity is creating something that's completely different and that's something that hasn't been, existed before. But when you actually look at uh, a lot of what is created, uh, there's a lot of the great ideas and the great new products, they're actually a, a synthesis of various ideas so that you get something that's unique. So it, it's more of a synthesis process rather than some abstract idea of creating something completely different out of nothing. Welcome to the Engage to Innovate podcast. Hi, I'm Judy Selmont. You know, our world evolves through innovation, and as business leaders, we have to step out of our comfort zone, which is never easy heading into totally new territory. But this podcast is all about helping you tackle that adventure. We talk to people who have done it before and those who have worked with innovators. So let's get started on our next journey of discovery. Welcome to the Engage to Innovate podcast. I'm Judy Selmans, and on this week's show, I'm chatting to Chris Collingwood. He specializes in helping organizations create, describe, and apply innovation models using neuro-linguistic programming, or NLP. He's also developed a graduate certificate in NLP, which he markets through his business, Inspirative. As an experienced psychologist, coach, consultant, and trainer, he works with a variety of organizations to help understand the patterns we all have and how to manage them. So welcome to the Engage to Innovate podcast, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. Good to be here. Yeah, cool. So actually, we were just chatting before about how you're a Kiwi living in Australia and I'm an Australian living in New Zealand, So, which is, which is pretty funny, really. But um, uh, and it's such a yeah great time of year, and we're just in the in the new year and ready to get started into 2020. Which I know for certainly with innovation, I think is you know when I was a kid, there was always this dream of what what happens in 2020. We're going to be mm. flying cars and we're going to be doing all these wild things with innovation and. Maybe we're not quite there, although I did actually read a great blog, in fact, that there are some fantastic things going on with drivable cars, with yeah. flying cars rather. So, you know, we're probably not too far off that. And and um, so I'd love love your to pick your brains on, on what you think makes innovation where we, maybe you think we'll end up going with innovation and how and, um NLP plays a part in that and, yeah. and picking personalities. And that's really where I want to take the conversation today. Okay. Well, well certainly there are a lot of innovations coming. Um, um, one of the famous um, neuroscientists, a guy called, called uh, V.S. Ramachandran, he runs the Centre for the Mind in San Diego. He said, a, 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 I think it was back in, in around 2000, that the 21st century was going to be the cognitive century. So he's expecting the century to be uh, making great, great strides in how we think and, and, and uh, how, how our brains work and how, and how we behave. Um, certainly, I think the, there's no doubt that some of the big, big changes that are, that are on the way are in biotechnology, um, what with gene editing, uh, just, just yeah. phenomenal what they can do with that. Um, so th the changes that are happening uh, are quite remarkable. And um, um, I, I think we ain't seen nothing yet. I, I, I think the world is, is going to change in the next 10 years in, in, in some very dramatic ways. Uh, certainly, I, th I think yeah. NLP is a great tool uh, in terms of assisting people in terms of innovation. And um, yeah. there are certainly patterns, I think, that people have who are, who are very innovative in their thinking. I'd really, I'm really curious about that because, you know, you often hear many people saying that, um, oh, I'm not creative or they, they don't feel they can do that and they feel that innovation is about being creative. And I personally want to, de you know, debunk that myth yes. because you don't have to be creative to be innovative for a start. 
um, you know, yes, you need some ideas, but I think if you know your business, and and I'm sure you've seen instances working with with um, your clients where because they know their business so well that they can, in fact, be creative within that industry. Yes, ab- absolutely. Um, there's a couple, a couple of nice ways to debunk this whole thing about creativity. So, so for example, the evidence is that we as individuals, as human beings, are all creative. Uh, this comes from the world of linguistics. Uh, so in linguistics, every human being will create new sentences, new and unique sentences. So that's an huh. example of creativity. So we're all creative to start off with. Two, yeah. one of the problems people – it's, it's, it's the concept that people have of creativity. <clears throat> so if you think of crea- creativity means you're creating new art or, 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 or new products, if it, a lot of people think creativity is creating something that's completely different and something that hasn't been, existed before. But when you actually look at uh, a lot of what is created, uh, there's a lot of the great ideas and the great new products, they're actually um, a, a synthesis of various ideas so that you get something that's unique. So it, it's more of a synthesis process rather than some abstract idea of, of, um, of creating something completely different out of nothing. Absolutely. And I've also found that sometimes really the, the most innovative ideas in one industry have been pinched from another. Yes. So it's just because it's, you know, it's – been done before doesn't mean it's been done before in your particular sector so you can pitch from all sorts of different places you know you can find it's amazing where ideas can come from and that that can turn into innovation absolutely as an example um one of the great thinkers of the 20th century he died back in 79 was an anthropologist called Gregory Bateson now Bateson ended up making Mm -hmm. contributions not only to anthropology but also to uh, what they call the deep ecology movement. So he's one of the father, grandfathers, really, of the deep ecology movement, uh, family therapy, systems thinking, um, uh, psychiatry. He made a whole series of contributions to multiple fields. However, when you look at his background, he came from a family of natural historians. It's kind of like the forerunner huh. of, of genetics. And... Um, so the Basin family and, and the Darwin families are two very famous families from, from uh, Cambridge. So they used to say there's always been yep. a, a Bateson at Cambridge. But rather than going into natural history, he went and became an anthropologist. And he took the ideas, the ways of thinking of a natural historian into a completely new field, anthropology, and that's where he started making his third major innovations and contributions to the field. He then took hmm. that way of thinking into other fields, psychiatry, family therapy, et cetera. And you often find uh, very creative, uh, uh, innovative thinkers uh, are trained in one field and they take the ideas and ways of thinking, what we call patterns of thinking, and they take it into a different field. And I think you see the same thing in business. Um, yeah. um, if you take uh, Peter Thiel's um, uh, company, uh, Palantir, it's a, a multi-billion dollar company nowadays and um, he took the idea of of um, using uh, algorithms to find patterns uh, to, to search for major patterns that indicate for example terrorism uh, you know, security, right. security problems but then he combined it with trained human analysts and he put the two things together and that combination of the software but also the trained uh, uh, people, the trained, the trained intelligent uh, uh, analysts, those two things together is what made, has made his company extremely effective and, and, and very successful. So it's yeah. a, a transfer of that ways of thinking from one field or one area into another, I think is one of the uh, key, key ways that people innovate. And maybe it's it's somewhat why many people say that you you, you an innovator can't come from within the same industry. I, I often hear that, yeah. where you know um, Uber is such a good example, and I guess Airbnb to a degree. So um, you know Facebook, all of those sort of big ones, they weren't in that space to start with. They yeah. just saw a need, and potentially as a consumer, in fact, so. Um, you know, you, it, it's easier to innovate when you're not 
bogged down by the the burdens of of running the business. But I I personally believe that we can maybe change that and not be so held to ransom by the potential of someone coming in and disrupting us. And that's what yeah. I feel is something we can learn. Is there something that in your training can help us, you know, think beyond that? Yes, a- absolutely. Um, I mean, just backing up on that, there's a, there's a great book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by a man called uh, okay. uh, Kahn. And um, written back in the 70s, uh, very early 70s, And what they found is um, people in any field, and it could be a business, it could be a a, a, a large, well-established business, people get enculturated into a way of thinking the culture of the organisation or the culture of the field. So it could be a field like psychology uh, or or, or any other field. And then what, what happens is often it's somebody makes somebody is often an outsider who comes in <clears throat> with a different way of thinking that disrupts the the, the, the old way who has not been yeah. uh, has not been uh, should we say inculturated um, uh, in, into into the field or the industry so often these yeah. motivations do come from outsiders now in terms of our work in terms of our training we, we actually teach people to think in first principles to think in terms of patterns and you know patterns of thinking and to be able to generalize those new and different ways of thinking into multiple situations um what's surprising to me in the field of nlp we're starting to see the same problems that you see in other fields where where if a person's been taught let's say nlp only uh, in the, in the context the situation of coaching so people go oh this is coaching and so the patterns they learn, they only apply in coaching and they don't realize that those same patterns could be applied, let's say, in management consulting or in parenting right. or in sports performance or, uh, or, or um, in, you know, negotiation. So they, the, the, the fact they've enculturated and, 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 and think about the patterns they've learned, the patterns of things they've learned applying only, oh, this is coaching. And this is right. where, where, where this, this to me, uh, prevents or, or, or uh, inhibits uh, innovation. It's when people think in first principles and go, here's a pattern that applies in one situation. Can I apply it in this other situation and then another situation? Uh, and that's, that supports creativity and, and innovation. Uh, Elon Musk is a yep. good example. Um, he, he he went into an industry that he was he had no background in, uh, you know, making cars. But because he yep. thinks in terms of patterns, he thinks in terms of first principles. He he wasn't enculturated into the way, the normal way, the usual way cars are manufactured. So as a result, yeah. he did it, uh, from from the basics and found he continues to keep he and his company keep coming out with new very different ways of solving major problems of manufacturing, manufacturing, uh, well, in their case, electric cars. Um, yeah. So it's that, it's that um, really, it's that thinking in, in terms of first principles that make a huge difference. Can, can you just, just I, I might be a little bit naive on this. Well, I am, like, I, to be honest with you, I'm not familiar with the turn of a pattern of first principles. So what do you mean like a belief system? Is, uh, is, would that be another way of wording it? Uh, no, 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 it's not, though there may be a pattern in how a person uh, holds a belief uh, but but not a belief. Right. So, for example, all a pattern is is a repeating sequence. Where if you've got the first part of the, the part of the sequence, you can predict the second. So, a good example, a very simple example, is I have a pet cat that's a Bengal cat. Now they, they like to leap right. and they like to jump up onto people's shoulders, and they're, they're quite outgoing, exuberant cats. So, if she comes up to me and and pauses, looks up. Um, uh, at my shoulder, and then I see her starting to push down on her legs, I can predict that she's about to leap up onto my shoulder because I've seen the first okay. part, the first part of the sequence, yeah. I can predict the second. That's a pattern. 
And as yeah. human beings, everything we do is made up of patterns. So how we drive a car, how we uh, communicate with our partners or children if we have children, um, you know, how we negotiate, you know, how we eat breakfast, um, everything we do is made up of patterns. How we innovate is a pattern. So all they are are a sequences, a, a, a sequence of of how, of how we think. For example, um, so a person might make a decision by running a simple pattern, a, a simple sequence. So they might imagine an option. What, let's say they've got three options to choose from. They're going to decide. Yeah. Let's say they're buying a car. So they imagine the first car. That might be the first thing in the sequence. They might then talk to themselves about whether the car they're imagining is going to meet their needs. And then they might get a feeling about it. That's the pattern. So then they take the second option in right. that, have a chat to themselves about whether that car meets their needs, get a feeling for it, repeat the sequence a third time, imagine the third option, the third car, <clears throat> talk to themselves about whether that meets their, their their needs, their values, and get a feel for it. And then they go, oh, the, 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 the second one, let's say, felt best, so that's the one they take. That would be a thinking okay. process. That's a pattern. So how we make decisions. Uh, we all have our way oh. of making decisions. That's a pattern. So everything we do is made up of patterns, and that's the fund of, fundamental building block of NLP. You know, it's what we study, how people do what they do, including how they innovate. Yeah, so is there particular, um, oh, you know, it's years ago someone put me in a category when they, they had um, done some NLP study of some description and then, you know, after spending half an hour with me, sprouted off that, oh, I was this type of person, whatever it was, I can't remember. Yeah. Um, it, it, yeah. Is it, does it fit in? Does NLP fit in with personality types? Uh, no, it doesn't. So, so first of all, <laughs> um, you, were, you were given a mis- – it was a misservice to put you into a box. So yeah. there are people who claim to teach NLP that say that people are visual or auditory or – kinesthetic so that they're either predominantly thinking pictures or uh, sounds or words or sensation yep. um, it, it turns out that's patently untrue because we as creative human beings we use all of our senses we we do think in pictures and sounds and uh, language and sensation Right. But the idea was that one predominance, one one is predominant. Well, um, it all depends what you're doing. I mean, if I'm at the art gallery, I'm going to be thinking more in terms of images, of course. Right. But then again, yep. then again, if I'm at a concert, sounds, but not just sounds, feelings as well. The same with the art gallery, pictures and feelings. So it all depends on what the person's doing. Now. Um, in my world, I'm very wary of a lot of the psychological testing and personality typing. Mm. So I think it puts people into boxes. And um, the, 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 the major concern is that a person may believe the typing that they've been given. And yeah. um, then their, their behavior may change to fit the type. So. Yeah. As an example, I've seen that happen with me so often. Sorry, Chris, again, I'm interrupting you, but to, just because I, I, the amount of jobs I've you know worked in in the past or whatever, and I've done quite a few of the the big personality studies, and I get back this report and I go, well, that ain't me. I don't yeah. know who it is. <laughs> so, you know, that's not me. And and then you, so a lot of big companies these days engage with these personality studies to pigeonhole us and then to go, oh, well, then that person's not a creative, so we don't get them involved in the ideation section. Um, yeah. This person's more of this and an organiser, so we have them doing this part. But that may not necessarily actually be the right thing for that person. And so, you know, from, from where I sit in an innovation perspective is that involving the whole team in this process and making sure you understand your team mm. uh, to me is really really important and um, and no not pigeon 
holding everybody and to fit into this box and, yeah. Yeah, it's most unfortunate. I think it does a great disservice to people and I think it's a disservice to the organisation in the longer run. And uh, because yeah. it stifles, it can stifle uh, creative creative people and or can stifle, stifle people who have the potential to be innovative. And yeah. um, the interesting thing about personality is a lot of people in our type of cultures, our Western societies, often think that personality is somehow fixed. And um, yeah. a long tradition in Western thought that personality is fixed. You can go back to uh, um, St. Augustine and, um, uh, you know, um, as the twig is bent, so the tree shall grow. Or you can go back to um, um, the Jesuits, you know, give me a boy to the age of seven and, you know, we've got him for Christ for life. This idea uh, is that, that right. the, the, these metaphors are that people – somehow their personalities are fixed. Yet um, um, there's been studies done in psychology, uh, long-term studies where they've studied people over 70, you know, 75 years. So they've had personality tests in, in childhood and, and then later on and then in, in, in uh, uh, their senior years. And they found that just in the difference between a, a person as a young adult and then as a senior, People radically change their personalities over a lifetime. So yeah. it's 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 our personalities are very rich and very changeable. Um, and I mean, as a here's a nice uh, metaphoric way of thinking about it. If we could take Einstein, for example, we could let's say he's alive mm -hmm. and he's a young man, and we were able to take him out of Switzerland and drop him into um, um, like some culture somewhere. An, an indigenous culture that's living an indigenous lifestyle and make sure mm -hmm. you have no contact with anybody that speaks English or, you know, French or German <clears throat> and that he's left there for a couple of years, what would he do? He would acquire the language. He would learn to speak the language of the people. Um, as a male, he would learn to hunt and, uh, and so on and so forth, and he would develop behaviours and skills that fit for that particular uh, culture and for that environment within which that, 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 that group of people lives. Now, his personality yeah. would change, no doubts about it. Um, yeah. and, um, and you see this with people, they, they have new experiences and, uh, or a series of new experiences and their personalities change. So it's, it's not a fixed thing. And um, I think a lot of it is is learning, is learned. So um, I think the yeah. holding of people is, in my world, is quite criminal, frankly. Yeah, no, I, I'm, it's an, it's actually quite refreshing to hear that because I, um, yeah, I mean, I, I can understand it to a degree, but but you just have to have a le that element of flexibility. So I really enjoy listening to that. So it's, you know, I I guess one of the things I'm just I'm going to take this back to, to business mm. people and the leaders that are listening to us and how can they use, um, how can they motivate a team so that, you know, because innovation is a team sport. Yes. It's, it's not something that somebody does in isolation predominantly. You know, there's lots of people involved from team to customers to all sorts of other different um, stakeholders. But in a, in a business environment, a leader has to be able to motivate yeah. their team and get them excited about where they want to go, if they want to go down the innovation route. Are there tips you can share with us on on making that communication easier? You know, even I remember you you actually read wrote a, an interesting article on leading effective meetings and, yeah. and really in in uh, uh, on, on your LinkedIn. So it's. It's even using those techniques to, to motivate the team. Have you got any tips for us? Um, look, yes, uh, and, and it's really where to start because there are multiple angles to take. <laughs> so one part is how we set frames as leaders. So how do we frame an interaction with somebody? Um, you know, you, a lot of innovation does come from teams. It's, it's, it's often, it's often uh, the group working together uh, that comes up with new ideas. So, and in terms of leading a group, uh, it comes down to how 
uh, uh, how 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 the uh, the outcomes and 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 uh, tasks are, are framed. So framing skills is, is very important. Um, now, uh, one one of, the, one of the problems you see that, that gets in the way is some leaders micromanage. If you're micromanaging yeah. people, it, it's very difficult for them to to. Uh, to, to to take responsibility and accountability and to actively uh, in, engage with creating new ideas. Um, I want to contrast this with a, a very a very skilled or you know wonderful general manager that my partner and I modelled uh, quite some time ago. Uh, he hit, headed up a uh, division of a, a major Australian corporation, <clears throat> multinational, and um, right. Uh, they, his team, his his people, uh, his division had the record for getting a joint venture project um, uh, negotiated through and up and running uh, in China uh, at the time. And he had a fabulous way of managing and leading people. So he focused on the big picture, the what. So yeah. he would set outcomes. These are the, this is the vision of the organisation. This is what we want to create. And he would frame that with uh, the people that reported to him. So he'd make sure that he is very clear about what he wanted, you know, the outcomes, and yeah. then he would give them a free hand to work out the how. So their job was was to, to was to to come up with the the ways and means to create the outcomes. He gave them a lot of uh, a, a lot of leeway, and. Um, um, we met. Not, not only did we work with him because um, we were building a model of his leadership skills, but also we built a model right. of how they how his team did cross cultural negotiations in, in Asia. Okay, um, um, his team uh, would walk would walk over hot coals for this man um, because yeah. he was such a good leader. Um, he didn't micromanage at all. He focused on the what, the outcomes, and and yeah. and. His job was to make sure that his team had all the necessary resources to yeah. to, to achieve their outcomes. So yeah, I, I, that's so so important, Chris, because so many people, as you say, the micromanaging and and but it it, it empowers people. It makes fit people feel valued in a team, which is so critically important. And. And in fact, I believe one of the key reasons why people change jobs even is that yeah. they just don't feel valued. They're not they're not able to contribute into a business, and and they want to. They 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 have a vested interest in the success of your business. So um, so not trusting them with that and giving them the tools, yeah, is yeah. really important. I mean, I, I've done this in my own. So uh, I had this wonderful employee, and when. When he agreed to to work work for us, um, um, the agreement I made with him is, is I said, look, we're outcome driven, results results driven. Um, I'll talk about the outcomes um, and and uh, make sure that you're in agreement with the outcomes. Um, you focus on how to do it, how how to, how to achieve, you know, you, you, on the processes and so on. And as part of it, I don't care if you take time out, time off from work when you need to. Um, I'm, I'm not concerned about the, the nine to five, the, the, the hours. Um, I gave him yeah. a free hand in terms of the, in terms of the hours that he worked. Uh, I, 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 the agreement was it's all about getting outcomes. And uh, as a result, yeah. he, he was an absolutely superb employee. And he would come up with ideas that he would then bring to me. Yeah. So uh, yeah. And, and and okay, it's a small business. Um, um, however, the same those same ways of thinking in terms of uh, the uh, the managers whole, having the vision, setting the big picture stuff, make sure everybody is clear about about what they want to achieve, he or she wants to achieve yeah. the leader, and and a couple of other things too, making sure that uh, the leader demonstrates through his or her behaviour an expression of the values. That they state that the organisation claims, yeah, you know, that the organisation yeah. has. So, yeah. so you've got this values alignment. Uh, you've got skilled, you know, people skills in terms of how, uh, in terms of um, uh, the relationships and and the framing of outcomes. 
and making sure that that people know that you as a leader you can be approached uh, to make a good business case for required resources. Uh, and I think those things really do make a difference. I think there's a I think yeah. can be cultural inside organisations. I think something. Oh, very much yeah. so. I totally agree, Chris. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, if you if you, I mean, it, it has to be a top up, top down, you know, decision. You know, you if you're at the, if you're running a business or you you own the business and you decide that you want it to be an innovative culture, that you want to be at the top of your game and coming up with new ideas and de- developing them and presenting new opportunities to customers, then that is to absolutely has to be part of your culture and yes. part of your, your whole mantra. If you, if you want to, and this is, I think a lot of businesses become unstuck by the attitude of they were successful, they, they run a successful business today, um, and and they're happy with that, you know. I, I've seen it and spoken to many business owners that are mm. doing quite nicely, thank you very much, and, and they don't really need or feel they need to innovate. Now, maybe if they don't have a family to pass it on to and they're happy just for it to wind down and disappear one day, but they're the businesses who are ripe for disruption. Yeah. And, you know, it just takes one innovative competitor someone you you know literally your competitor could be doing what you're not mm. and 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 you're gone you're, you're blowing out so i just don't think businesses these days can afford to not embrace that innovative culture and, and, and unfortunately a lot of businesses don't um don't, mm. don't change and start focusing on innovation until it's too late um yeah so disruption comes along it's out of the blue they didn't see it coming and and all of a sudden they've gone from being you know a, a, a nice a nice business a good business to struggling. Yep. And yep. Um, um, I think with the nature of you know the changing world and technology that there are going to be mm. yeah, I think it's an, there's a risk of acceleration of disruption to a lot of well established businesses and. Um, I would certainly suggest to people now's the time to start thinking in an innovative way and to actively build a culture of innovation in your business. If you've got an established business and you're not actively innovating, uh, you're at great risk. Totally, Chris. I and and I think you you spot on. You see so many businesses who are, you know, doing okay and and you know they might have a few new toys and and you know it's, it's all good and you know plenty of staff and they're all organised and they've got a good system or whatever they're doing. But it, it's just so dangerous an attitude these days. You know, we've always had. Um, to to survive, you go back through history that everything has been. Everything evolves because of an innovative culture within a business. So it, it's, you know, the first car, Henry Ford, it, and it's on, on, and on, and on, and on from there. We've always had that. But I think you're right. Now we have where, where all the traditional businesses are being disrupted a lot by technology. Yeah. And, and, and that is even an extra stress. And, oh, my God, the stress of going one day I've got a really great business and I've got – you know, paying 20-odd staff or whatever it is, and then the next day, holy dooly, I've got a major competitor and they're, they're doing things that I can't match. Yet by just maybe listening to customers, listening to team, having a system that's in place for innovation, right. as you say, allowing for that, yeah. Henry Ford, is a very, you know, Henry Ford is a very good example of innovation and then uh, a lack of innovation. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if many people know about it, but um, most people know about the original innovation where they basically iterated and kept building better products and then finally came out with a Model T, you know, one, one colour, and, of course, used a production line to be able to... to, to yes. see. That was the innovation, was, was the product... Well, that's part yeah. of the innovation was the uh, product, uh, production line. However, yeah. um, so at that point, he, they, they were the number one car company in the US. Now, where he fell down is they kept producing Model T, the Model T for years, and uh-huh. General Motors got formed. And what General Motors did, they came up with this idea of bringing out a new model 
every year. Yeah. So a new model, yeah. and, and so the market changed, but um, from wanting just a cheap mass-produced car for every man, you know, every man and woman, to yeah. to people uh, wanting uh, uh, differences in their cars and, and different colors and yeah. and, and, and different yeah. features. And um, he, such an important point, Chris. And yeah. He held on. He held on despite uh, advice. He held on to um, his, uh, his his dream that had been successful, the Model T. Mm. And um, it, I think it was five, eight, eight, nine years. It was a number of years before they finally woke up and then produced a new model. But by that time, yep. they were no longer number one. They became yep. they became number three. And yeah, people yeah. can be you can meet people who are early in their career may be very innovative and then they stop innovating. They've got something that works, yeah. they sit on their laurels, it's working nicely, if they're a nice little earner, it's all lovely, the business is going fine, etc. And um, and they stop innovating. And they're the yeah. Uh, yeah. very great risk um, from uh, being disrupted by a new player. Yeah, no, it, it, that innovation isn't a once-off, you know, show. You, you're absolutely spot on, Chris, because you you must, you, it it actually has to be, that's why going back to what you originally said, it's got to be part of your business culture because then it becomes an innovative, and Amazon, like, like them or not like them, the reason why they're continuing to be successful is that mm. they keep innovating in new areas. Elon Musk, of course, is another great example these days, but on a smaller scale, you can do it just because you're not, you know, a Jeff Bezos and, and have the multi-billion dollars to, of course, now continue to have an innovative culture. It doesn't mean you can sit back and rest on that. You 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 just have to keep innovating. You have to keep up with what's new, what's being done in other industries, what's what maybe customers are doing and not doing and how you can diversified, that's all part of being an innovative culture. Yeah, really, really invaluable advice, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I was thinking of, um, you know, let's say small players or people who are new to business, uh, keep in mind that, you know, the Elon Musk's and, and the Jeff Bezos, uh, et cetera, you know, Am uh, um, Amazon, uh, these people started um, with an idea. They didn't have yep. uh, vast amounts of capital when they began. They started yeah. with an idea, an innovative idea. And then um, uh, the great thing is these people have continued to innovate through time yeah. and to build cultures yeah. of innovation in their organisations. So yeah. uh, any business of any size um, can, can, can um, adopt uh, innovative thinking and build an innovative culture for sure. Absolutely. We all start from somewhere. We're all born, yeah. you know. <laughs> It just doesn't. You don't. You don't. You're not born into being that superhero to start with. You develop it over time. Yeah. I, another thing I've noticed in some of your writing is is um, is what you call soft skills, which I guess I call more of an EQ. Yeah. Um, is does EQ and and you call it soft emotional skills? How important are they? From a leader's perspective, I guess, and again, keeping in to keep it to the innovation, yeah, is that important? And do you encourage that in your team? Absolutely. So you'll find that really exceptional leaders have great soft skills, and I'll, I'll, I'll just quickly define what I mean by soft skills. So people skills. Mm -hmm. So it's first of all, a, a, as individuals, often these great leaders are emotionally flexible. So mm -hmm. they, they, they're able to manage themselves and their own emotional states. So you've got the EQ part of it. Um, but other aspects of soft skills are the communication skills. You know, how do you actually connect with somebody, relate to the person? How do you, how do you use language in terms of how you frame ideas, you know, requests, uh, et cetera? So you've got those people skills, those, those communication skills. So it's one part is 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 – we can all develop and enhance our emotional intelligence. And another part yeah. of how we uh, relate to other human beings, you know, how do we relate to our team, the people that work with us and for us. And um, it, it, the, the term soft skills is an unfortunate term. That's the, 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 that's the accepted term and it's been around for a long time. 
So you've got the, it, it, it presupposes that you've got two types of skills in business, that you've got hard skills and soft skills. So the hard skills will be things like um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, um, the numbers, you know, the finances and, 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 uh, and so on. And, you know, the, uh, say the computer skills and the technical skills, those are hard skills. And then they call the people side of it soft skills. And it's unfortunate because um, uh, people then think that the hard skills are more important than the soft skills. However, um, it's people that drive uh, innovation and productivity inside organizations. It's the people that do it. And um, so really the soft skills in, in my Mm-hmm. Now, I'm biased because of the work I do, but I think it's yeah. what, what, what I am. I recognize that. And, and, and yeah. it's a soft skill. And that's cool. Yeah, that's what drives, uh, that's what drives success in, in organizations. And, yeah. um, you know, you can always get hold of the, 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 the so called hard skills, the technical skills, um, um, if you want to. I mean, I'm, I'm working on a uh, technology startup at the moment. And, um, um, I don't have any te- technology skills in terms of, um, you know, software and software platforms and so on. That doesn't matter. I can hire people for that. Um, yeah. Um, but the soft skills, you know, that's that impacts things such as, you know, recruitment. You know, how do you recruit people who have got good people skills and who also have the hard skills? You need both. Um, but those, yeah. those people skills and that emotional intelligence is, is what – builds the culture of an organization and that I think it's the culture that has a huge impact on on, on productivity and, and innovation in organizations. Yeah, I did remember reading something recently where it said you can, you know, don't hire for, for their technical skills because you can train someone to do that. Yeah. Um, and but if you if they don't have an EQ, if they don't have those soft skills, if they're unable to communicate in the team and uh, be part of that team, then then that's something that's very hard to teach someone. That's right. Um, well, I think you can teach people the, 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 the innovation for sure, uh, and you can teach people yep. uh, soft skills, and people can learn and, and and develop and enhance their emotional intelligence. All those things are learnable because there are patterns okay. of thinking and behaviour for all of those particular skills, and that's where for okay. me, me NLP, the NLP technology has been incredibly innovative uh, in, in that we have a technology where we can capture um, how people do what they do and and, uh, mm. and and package that up, you know, build models and, and transfer those those skills where they're needed. So it, it can be done through training. Now, I think, okay. I, I think it's better off to hire Will from the start. I think that the right <laughs> people build the right team first and then – yeah, we've got some people who've got some uh, emotional intelligence, good good communication skills, people skills, relationship skills, and then you can enhance from there. You can do some training and coaching to ha- to enhance those skills. Um, but I think yeah. it's better to hire to hire right 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 at the beginning, of course. Yeah, and and I guess having the right people for the right jobs. I mean, we've developed software, for example, in the past, and and uh, and you know there are. There are those that I just want to be technically able to do the job yeah. and and they do an amazing job at it and that's fantastic. But when it comes to communicating with them and yeah. uh, you just need somebody maybe to, in the middle to soften it out, particularly from, from my perspective with the technical thing because I didn't speak the same language literally as in, in, in every single concept of the way. So, um, uh, yeah, but... I, I actually, it's good to know that you can you can train people to improve their EQ because that's you know as you talk about your soft skills, uh, there's so much talk about really that is the career path. Those that don't have those are going to find it difficult to get employment because the machine can pretty much do everything these days just on the technical side. Yeah, absolutely, and I, I, I so, and I think it's that combination of technology such as algorithms and special platforms and so on and so forth combined with really good people who've got great people skills communication skills you know emotional intelligence those two things yeah. together is 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 what makes a difference it's not one or the other but it's both um i'm reminded yeah. um i think one of the very first consulting jobs i did um this is uh, a couple of de- well it's decades more than two decades ago 
I was asked by a company, they were uh, software people. So what they did is they they had a special software program which which was for financial institutions and uh, they would modify the software to fit the particular needs of the organization. So I'm talking um, okay. 30, 35 years ago. I'm kind yeah. of giving away my age. And um, so I, <laughs> the, the problem they had, and, I, and, and this is what they brought me in for, was they had the technical people would write the code and modify the code, and they had the customer service people who would meet with the customer and get the brief. And yeah, yeah. these two groups of people um, had disdain for each other. They did not get along. They, they <laughs> had, uh, shall we say, um, negative thoughts and, and uh, attitudes towards yep. uh, people in the other group. So the technical people um, thought, the, uh, thought that the uh, customer service people were a little bit, um, um, you know, um, flaky. I think it was yeah. you know, the best of you. <laughs> and and um and of course the, the customer service people just could not relate to the technical people at all. So you had yeah. two groups of people that needed to work together um to, to make things work. Um and so we designed a program to actually build a bridge between those two groups of people. Now that problem has been awesome. that's been around for decades. That's it's still a problem today. Yeah. Um uh, yeah, yeah. You get, let's say, a, a, a wonderful uh, coder, for example, software engineer, and he or she then gets promoted into a management role, and they're terrified. Yep. Because <laughs> they've yep. got to deal with people. I remember I interviewed one about a year ago, and um, and uh, I actually made a couple of interventions with him in, anyway. He's a nice guy. Um, seeing I was interviewing him, and uh, he loved writing code. Um, as, as he had a, he started learning how to write code at the age of eleven, um, and mm. um, and that's he's very very good at it. And they went and made him a manager. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Now in a leadership yeah. role, and he was absolutely terrified of people. He'd been terrified of people all his life because people are unpredictable. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, dear. You make a mistake, you can you, you just debug it. It's code. But yeah. people, oh, yeah. God, what do I do as a human being? You know. <laughs> What are they going to do? Yeah, no, oh, and, exactly. I, yeah. And uh, I, I, did, I did a couple of things with them just to, so that, and basically explained to them that the soft side of things, the so-called soft side of things, uh, they're just algorithms. It's just they're human algorithms. You know, people have patterns and sequences, and you know, sequences of behaviour, and there's ways of understanding that and working with that. That people can be predictable to a certain extent, and um, which was a great relief to them. But yeah, um, oh, I can say, actually, I could see that being really, really helpful to him. Actually, particularly if you're that type of person, so understanding of what to look for in the pattern yeah. and how to identify the pattern, I would think would would have made his job um, more enjoyable because you know otherwise he would have gone back to being a coder. I'm sure. Well, he, he actually he's, he's doing doing very well and uh, has uh, really adjusted to being a, a very good leader. Um, uh, oh, that's great! Um, but d delightful, delightful guy. I, uh, lovely. Yeah, guy. yeah. And, um, um, but the initial terror of being promoted into a management role. Oh yeah, yeah. And and you remembering that you know again, if we're talking about a, a culture of innovation, and you're terrified as a leader, then that makes it very difficult for you to to, to be driving that innovation. Yeah. So it, it's just it just all backfires on you and it, it doesn't work for anybody then. Yeah. Hey, look, yes. Chris, this has been really interesting chatting to you. What I'm going to do is put some links to some of the – you mentioned the book earlier on and I'll put some links to um, – what did you – structure of something around that you said. Um, it's been around for a long, long time, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by, okay. by Thomas – Kuhn, I think is how you pronounce it. And um, okay. I think the edition I have was, was published in 1971, I think. Uh, however, wow, okay. it's republished every now and again, um, and it's still a very, very good book. Yeah, well, we'll put a link on that and, and uh, a link to your website, of course, as well, Chris, and if anyone wants yes. to get in touch with you, they can. And um, if you've got any material you'd like to pass on to people, then then we'll, we can send put links on there as well for that. But 
Well, that's- thank you so much for your time today. It was it was interesting to, you know, because I'm I'm fascinated by the the personality types types. What drives this innovation? How can we introduce innovation into businesses? How can we make it yeah. easier for them so that's not such a frightening process? And you know, I mean. Unfortunately, a lot of innovation fails or innovation attempts fail. And I, I believe a lot of that is, is based on things like we're talking about of leadership and, and giving people time and, and the, the, the team skills and customer you know, insight, all sorts of things that are combined to it. And, um, you know, so all of this comes as a package to, to form innovation, really. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I, I think it uh, relates to culture and I think it's about building innovative culture. But the good thing is there are particular patterns that innovative people have and those patterns are learnable. Yeah. As simple as that. And yeah. so it's really uh, for anybody who wants those patterns, if they're committed to acquiring those skills, they can. If they want to build an innovative culture, they can. And yeah. Uh, but you know, part of the problem, I think, sometimes is the culture that's already there in an organisation. Um, about, I was talking to a colleague of mine. I did a cultural change program with. Um, you know, we were running it together, um, and she was saying that um, in the industry, a thirty percent, a thirty percent success rate in terms of a cultural change program is considered to be good. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, which is yep. really shocking to me, and uh, but I think um, it, it comes down to the to to the people side of it. Is that's how you change culture? It's people that change cultures. Yeah. People yeah. That, totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. No. And and it, and again, it's it's got to it's got to come from the top. You've got to make that decision that you want to be involved in that sort of thing. If you're happy to sit back and just take in the current rewards and the paycheck, fine. Yeah. Um, and, and good luck and I hope no one disrupts you, but that's, uh, you know, it's not really a great long-term strategy. But mm. All good. Thank you very much, Chris. That's awesome. I really appreciated your time. Oh, look, it's been my pleasure and uh, thoroughly enjoyed, enjoyed the experience.